Chapter 2. Rayo's Influence on the Libertarian Anarchist Community As should be evident, Rayo's work was basically forgotten until Kyle Reardon and I launched the Vanu podcast in January of 2017. But Rayo likely influenced a significant popular strategy within anarchist circles. Agorism. In Innovator, November 1965, Rayo wrote an article titled Self-Seeking Ethical Enclave, Black Markets. He defines an ethical enclave as voluntary transactions between individuals who are living under a collectivist government when said transactions are conducted independent of that government. Ethical denotes the distinguishing characteristics of the participating individuals and adherence to the ethical principles of voluntarism, the principle that no one should initiate violence or threats of violence against another, and enclave denotes physical immersion within a philosophically alien society. An ethical enclave is not necessarily a separate geographical entity. So, Rayo was an early voluntarist, before the term was reappropriated, and he was describing what would be more vernacularly known as an agora. He continues, An ethical enclave, by existing within the territorial domain of a coercive government, is either legal, utilizing intercises, in the taxes and regulations of that government, or illegal, operating despite threats of violence. Now he's describing the black and gray markets of agorism, either trading in goods and services that aren't illegal or dealing outright contraband. But he doesn't stop there. What are the differences between ethical enclave entrepreneurs and black market operators? He says that the differences are significant. The mixed premise, black market operator, while violating socialist laws, still holds, at least subconsciously, some of the premises embodied in laws. He may experience a depressing sense of guilt. He may act with the handicap of psychological conflicts. The enclave entrepreneur, however, disavows not only the particular instance of initiated violence, but the collectivist morality as well. He experiences an exhilarating sense of righteousness. He acts with the confidence and certitude of psychological consistency. The enclave entrepreneur, furthermore, is dealing not only with immoral, by their own definition, criminals, but with producers, with moral individuals who are committed on principle to hold confidences and honor contracts. His cost of doing business, therefore, tends to be less. In other words, he's calling your typical black market operator a controlled schizophrenic. See below. The ethical enclave operator has an exhilarating sense of righteousness as he recognizes the attempted violations of his autonomy and his act of rebellion in restoring it. Furthermore, he discusses the significance of dealing peer-to-peer -peer with like-minded individuals. Thankfully, this is the direction things have been going for about 20 years with open-source technology. Rayo was just, as always, way ahead of the curve. Recall the agorist notion of starve the state, then smash it. Even though ethical enclaves are, one, just an option for Vanuans, not a requirement, and two, small-scale, focused, with no goal of abolition. Vanuans are satisfied to coexist in protracted conflict with the state. Rayo still believed black and gray market trading could be a thorn in the state's side. Ethical enclave trading profits participating individuals and promotes liberty in general by reducing the plunder available to the collectivist government. Plunder which would most probably be used to finance further violations of liberty, plus propaganda to rationalize the violations. The potential effect of ethical enclave trading should not be underestimated. Mixed socialist governments direct most of their extortions and regulations at trade. They tax primarily income and sales, but transactions can easily be taxed only with the cooperation of at least one party to the transaction. Large-scale non-cooperation would render income and sales tax ineffective and greatly reduce government revenues, an ultimate check on a state's capability for violence against its subjects. An ethical enclave would also encourage growth of a libertarian movement by adding self-interested motivations. So, it sure as hell sounds almost identical to the strategy Sam Konkin, SEK3, proposed. The last question to answer is, was Konkin familiar with Rayo and Vanu? The answer? Yes. Undoubtedly. The following four excerpts are from articles published in the Southern Libertarian Review, January to June of 1975, all authored by Konkin, all of which you can find online. 1. Anarcho-Zionism The preform crowd either browned out or went into escapist trips such as becoming nomads, troglodytes, or wilderness dwellers. They sought 
Invulnerability to Coercion, or VANU, and Preform Inform became VANU Life. Recently, it sputtered to a halt, and the paranoia freaks drifted back to civilization. From that, we can gather that SEK3 was familiar with the Vanuans and their goals, likely from the publications themselves, as can be seen, his perception of them was quite gloomy to say the least. 2. Carrots and Sticks Before I leave Southern California, let me not slight anyone, but simply affirm that there are many libertarians I know well enough to exalt, but who have not the general fame for their less persistent endeavors, generally due to working for a living, an affliction found rarely on the East Coast. And there are others of fame that do not enjoy my personal knowledge, such as Joe Galambos, Natalie Hall, and Sky De Oros, El Rayo and Naomi Gatherer, and Lou Rollins, whose good and worthy efforts will someday earn them a more adept chronicler. So, he's highlighting the achievements of various individuals, two of them being Rayo and Naomi Gatherer, a.k.a. Roberta, Dr. Gatherer, his freemate. Additionally, our conception of Rayo during the 1960s and 70s is that he was not very well known. It seems like he was part of an extremely niche crowd, and if he enjoyed fame, it was not by the popular definition. That being said, the way Conkin phrases that last portion is interesting. Is it possible that Rayo was more popular than we originally assumed? Were or are there more Vanuans than we initially figured? Possibly. 3. Libertarian Strategy 1. So that we are not condemned to relive it, let's review our history. As of December 1968, Libertarian Strategy was directed either towards influence of the conservatives or conversion of the independents. It was wholly educational or retreatist. Robert Lefevre's Rampart College, Leonard Reed's Fee, Joe Galambo's FEI, Nathaniel Brandon's NBI, F.A. Harper's IHS, and Frank Kordorov's ISI were all educational institutes. The Vanu Lifers, Atlantis Group, and Oliver Wrights were seeking escape. Except for the liberal innovators leafleting of the Cow Palace in 1964, no libertarians were involved in a political campaign except as deviationist individuals. Many supported Nixon in 68, but they were clearly of conservative leanings. A little bit further. Many libertarians also turned inward with incessant psychology sessions and in-group self-criticism. This was the movements as reflected in 1972 in, say, New Libertarian Notes, and which could be pieced together from RAP, Libertarian Forum, Reason, Academic, Associates Letter, Vanu Life, Freeman, Sill News, Pacific Libertarian, and many local newsletters. Regarding the first quote, Sec 3 is quite accurate in stating that Vanu lifers were seeking escape. Although Rayo does discuss Vanu in cities, he notes that, I know of quite a few Vanuists and Libertarians who live, Allen, Humble's way, but I know none who seem to like it for very long. This is mainly due to the city's psychological pressures of the statist servile society, which is why Rayo prefers to live far enough back into the woods. Other than that main point, SEK3 is correct. The second excerpt is particularly interesting, though. Unfortunately, the only Vanu Life articles I have read are those found within Rayo's book, and any that have arrived in the batches of Vanu publications we've digitized. From that, I certainly don't gather the incessant psychology sessions or in-group self-criticism. Rather, from the entirety of the book, it mainly consists of back-and-forth discussions on strategy, with some philosophy sprinkled in. I'm not sure what Sec 3 was referring to here, but it is definitely possible that he is correct. Until we acquire a more complete library of those publications, we'll just have to take his word for it. 4. Counter Campaign, 76. And who could we all agree on without sacrificing our principles? Behind whom could students of Murray Rothbard, Robert Lefebvre, Ayn Rand, Leonard Reed, Joseph Galambos, Carl Hess, Robert A. Heinlein, El Rayo, Natalie Hall, and Harry Brown unite? Nobody. The point is this. Samuel Edward Conkin III, Sec. 3, was certainly aware of Rayo and had followed his work. Therefore, we can safely assume with a lot of evidence and similarities that agorism is a reformulation and development upon Rayo's concepts of ethical enclaves. Those aren't all the notable mentions of Rayo or Vanu, but we're damn near the end. In the August 1987 edition of Liberty Magazine, two articles discussing Rayo and Vanu were published. One by Benjamin Best titled, Tom Marshall, Innovator, A Week in the Wilderness and the second by R.W. Bradford, titled The Mystery Man of the Libertarian Movement. 
The full article is going to be found at www.vanupodcast.com. So I will only briefly summarize them. Just click on Articles About Vanu below the Start Here tab. In the first, Best discusses the time he met Rayo in 1967. It was as part of a program Rayo offered called Vanu Week, wherein individuals visited him in the Siskiyou region, Northern California, Southern Oregon, to learn about living the wilderness Vanu lifestyle. It is definitely valuable, yet this article was published 20 years after the fact and Best was awfully fixated on a woman. It's likely not a 100% accurate recollection of his experiences. The second is more so a retrospective, wherein Bradford discusses the focuses of the libertarian community at the time of Rayo, in addition to how far outside the box Vanuans were thinking and doing. In regards to Rayo's disappearances, Bradford writes, Some people speculate that he grew weary of his paranoid lifestyle and returned to straight society to live an ordinary life. But others, those who knew him most intimately, believed he succeeded in achieving Vanu, that he continues to live today, deep in the mountains of southern Oregon, living a fulfilling life as a hunter-gatherer, free at last of the oppression of the state. Knowing Rayo as intimately as I feel I do, there's no way in hell he could have just given up and returned to the servile society. So my speculation is that he continued to live the wilderness Vanu lifestyle, probably mostly in underground structures, until his death. As far as scouring the internet, those are all of the honorable mentions I've found of Rayo and or Vanuism. It's worth noting that in Jim Stum's publications, i.e. Self-Liberation Notes, Ocean Freedom Notes, Going Mobile, there are many letters discussing Rayo and or Vanu, but those all took place from the 1970s to the 1990s. You can download all of them for free by visiting vanupodcast.com. In conclusion, he certainly had a drastic impact on the libertarian community, even though the majority of the adherents have never heard his name. His contribution of ethical enclaves laid the framework for one of the most popular and efficacious strategies out there today, agorism. For the most radical libertarians of his day, he provided them with solutions in pursuance of personal freedom. When most of the libertarians around him were only interested in talking, man, things don't change much, huh? His work laid dormant for some 20 plus years, but it's back now, and with a vengeance. You, the reader, or listener, are a modern self-liberator.